Hello there. I thought I would start today's broadcast with a picture. It's a picture that um, that hangs in my office. It's one of my favorites. As you can see, it was a picture of the empty tomb, uh, something that we talked a lot about last week as we uh, went through the days of the most important week in the history of the world. And of course that that study ended with the resurrection which we addressed in, in our message on Sunday. Uh, that's really nice picture, nice print of uh, what the tomb would have looked like. And it's, if you want to check it out sometime, come in my office. It's actually, it's one of those pictures that has hidden pictures within the picture. It's really neat. I'm not sure I've found all the hidden pictures yet, uh, but it's it's, a, it's just a nice picture. Uh, so I thought what we would do um, is sort of a continuation of what we did last week. Nearly every day we uh, we studied the events of that particular day in the last week of Jesus' life. So now we're we're after uh, the week of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And, um, of course, there are a lot of things that happen in the days following the resurrection. And I thought we would look at uh, some passages that discuss that, especially, uh, you know, up until the time of Pentecost. Now, that, that word Pentecost means 50, or at least the first part of that word means 50. So it's 50 days after the resurrection where the day of Pentecost takes place. And a lot happens. A lot of important things happen in that time frame. Uh, not all of which we have. Of course, many other things did happen that aren't recorded for us. But those that are, are intended to build our faith, which we'll see. So we're going to read a few passages and make some comments on them. And uh, hopefully this will be a, a good way to sort of wrap up that series that we've gone through. Appreciate all your uh, comments and compliments of the, the messages that not only I, but Sharon and others have, have been able to give through this medium. And uh, it's been a labor of love for us because I think we've all appreciated being able to do it. Uh, but to get into our study for this evening, um, I want to start out in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. And um, we'll talk a little bit about this, this thing that happened with the disciple named Thomas. Um, in John chapter 20, uh, just reading a few verses beginning in verse 19, it says there, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, now that's referring to the actual first Lord's Day, the Resurrection Day, okay? So this, this reading starts out on the day Jesus came out of the tomb. That evening, John says in John 20, verse 19, he says, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. We're going to see this not only here, but a week from this time where the disciples are behind locked doors. They are not yet men of faith. Um, they will be soon, but they are not yet. They're afraid of the Jews. It says, despite that, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. That's certainly something they needed. They didn't have any of it yet. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Another theme we see running through these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus several times, it seems like, at least at first, uh, it's not clear to the disciples who Jesus is. Uh, don't know why that is, but it does seem to, to happen several times. Um, but, you know, the disciples were glad when finally they saw it was the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, so this is the one of the appearances of Jesus on the very day that he came out of the tomb to his disciples. Now verse 24 says, When Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, he was not with them when Jesus came, for whatever reason. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Apparently when Thomas came back. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into its side, I will never believe. All right, so that's, again, that all happens on that very first Resurrection Sunday, uh, the day that Jesus was, was raised from the tomb. But verse 26 it gets us to a week later. In fact, John says eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, notice, despite the fact that Jesus has already appeared multiple times to multiple people, uh, they're still behind locked doors. And Jesus came and stood among them. Despite the fact that the doors were locked, he is passing through locked doors, and he said, Peace be with you. Something, again, they still didn't have, but needed. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Of course, that includes all of us. Uh, Jesus pronounces a blessing on us who have believed despite the fact that we've never seen him. Thomas said, I have to see him or I won't believe. But we hopefully have said, I believe, even though we haven't seen him. Well, uh, we don't know why Thomas missed the first appearance, but he, he overcomes his skepticism finally as Jesus reveals himself to them a week later, the following Sunday, uh, one week after Jesus had raised from the dead. And uh, then we get this great passage in John, which often is called the purpose statement of John's gospel, verses 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Again, pointing out that not every single event is recorded, but the ones that are recorded are to drive us to faith that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the Messiah, he is King Jesus, he is the Son of God. And then, uh, as, as chapter 21 of, of John opens, we have another interesting setting. Um, it says, uh, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, that's the Sea of Galilee, normally called Galilee in other places. Tiberias was the most important sea, uh, most important city along that sea. Uh, you can visit Tiberias today uh, once travel restrictions are lifted. Uh, and if you pay them enough money for flight and so forth, uh, it's a beautiful spot looking out over the Sea of Galilee, but it's an important city. And so sometimes the, the lake there was called the Sea of uh, Tiberias, after its most important city. And Jesus reveals himself to the disciples there, and he did it in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, notice we have Thomas again, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. 
They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Notice uh, where the disciples are uh, now. Up in Galilee, not in Jerusalem behind locked doors. They're up in Galilee. Jesus had actually instructed them to go there, and so they have obeyed, at least in that. And you wonder, what are they doing? Um, Peter saying, I'm going fishing. It's easy to misread that. You know, if I say to you today, I'm going fishing, uh, you realize I'm going out to enjoy myself. It's a pastime. It's something I like to do. Um, these guys, several of them, were fishermen by trade. This was their life work. And Peter isn't going out to fish um, because he enjoys it as recreation. Uh, we we imagine that Peter is considering going back to his old job, his former profession of fishing. And uh, these, these guys join him on this occasion. And um, Jesus is going to change their plans, of course, as he often has. Uh, but they, they, don't, they don't have any success, at least at first. They get into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Then it goes on in verse 4 of John 21, Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Again, you see the trend uh, of not recognizing him, at least at first, when he appears. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Uh, that's John referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John said to Peter, you know who that is, um, and, and identifying who the man on the shore was. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his, his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. Interesting situation there. Uh, again, Jesus not immediately recognized. They get this incredible catch of fish. In fact, we know how many fish they caught. Uh, as John tells us as the reading goes on, the specific number, 153. And he, he also mentions uh, that, that they were all large fish. There was no, um, no non-keepers. In, in, in this hall that they made, 153 large fish. And uh, all of that you see, serves to, to ingrain in them and remind them who this is they're dealing with, that this is indeed Jesus. And, and this is the, uh, the, third, the third appearance um, of Jesus to the disciples as a group. Uh, there, there have been about seven total appearances up to this point, but the, this is the third time that he appears to the disciples as a group. It's not the full group uh, of the 11. There's not 12 now, remember. Judas is gone, um, and he, he'll be replaced soon. This isn't uh, the full group. In fact, there are seven uh, that are listed in, in what we read there. Um, but this is the third time he's come before a group of the, dis of the disciples. And uh, you have that famous story of Jesus and Peter and their interchange on the beach and Jesus restoring Peter, uh, which is a, a great study in itself. We're not going to take time for it right now. So you have this appearance on the beach sometime you know, more than a week after the uh, the actual resurrection day. 
The next sort of chronological event that takes place seems to be the time when Jesus gives the Great Commission, what we call the Great Commission, to the disciples. Uh, it's recorded for us last chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28, and also um, last chapter of Mark, Mark 16. And it's interesting in Matthew's account of it, verses 16 through 20 of Matthew 28, as he tells the story, he points out that the, the 11 are still struggling with their faith. When Jesus appears to them, uh, it says some of them worshipped him, uh, but others did not yet believe. Uh, despite everything, all the appearances we talked about, they're still struggling uh, at times to, to believe. Excuse me there for a minute. Uh, but on, on this occasion, you know, he, he proclaims his authority to them. He gives them this charge, this commission, this mission to go into all the world and to spread the, the good news, to teach it, to baptize people, to, to make disciples of others. And um, that's recorded again at the end of those first two Gospels, Matthew and Mark. There are several other appearances, resurrection appearances, that Jesus makes that we haven't um, gone over. Um, we learn from other passages that, for instance, Jesus appeared to more than 500 disciples on one particular occasion. We don't know when or where that was, but... Um, Scripture, New Testament tells us that he made an appearance to a big group, at least once, to a group of 500. We know also that he appeared to James, his brother, his, his stepbrother, half-brother. He appeared individually to him. So sometimes he appeared to big groups, uh, sometimes to small groups, and sometimes to individuals like James. And we, we also know that, uh, that he appeared to all the apostles, um, other than Judas, of course, at one time or another, uh, like he appeared to James. Uh, we also know later, uh, significantly later, he will appear to a man named Saul, uh, who will eventually become Paul, the great missionary of the early church. Uh, but this is after this period of time that we normally call the post-resurrection appearances but he does appear to, to Saul on the road to Damascus, Syria, and uh, speaks to him. He, he makes these appearances, not the one to Saul, but all these others that we've talked about and referred to. Jesus makes these appearances over a period of about 40 days, so a little more than a, than a month. Um, and if you think about it, about the length of time that that we've been in the situation we're in. Uh, it's about the amount of time Jesus appeared to his disciples. And then after that period of 40 days, a little more than a month, Jesus ascends to heaven. And, um, and we'll talk about that event here just in a moment as we, we close this study. But after the ascension, after Jesus uh, is taken up into heaven in front of his disciples. About 10 days after that, uh, in the city of Jerusalem, you have the events of Acts chapter 2, uh, the great day of Pentecost, which we started off talking about, uh, when, when the church is established, the gospel is preached, and uh, 3,000 are baptized. Uh, that's 10 days after this 40-day period. So if you think about it, you add 40 plus 10, and at least in the old math, that, that made 50. And that's where we get the term penta, Pentecost, 50 days. And um, that is um, how that works out. So uh, just a little bit on the chronology there. But lastly, let's talk about the ascension itself. Uh, I found that that is a, a story that isn't talked about near as much as it deserves. Um, 
Mark tells of it, about it, Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. Uh, but the text I want us to hear is the one from Luke. Now Luke sort of tells the story twice. As we know, Luke writes the Gospel of Luke, but that's just volume one of a two-volume work, volume two being the book of Acts. And so both in the last chapter of Luke, Luke 24, and in the first chapter of Acts, uh, he narrates part of the story of the ascension of, of Jesus. And I want us to look at both of those um, to wrap this up today, this evening. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through, through 53. Let me get to it here. It says there, Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So that's how Luke ends his volume one, his gospel. Uh, then again, in chapter one of Acts, Starting at verse 6, he adds a little to that story. It says there, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice that they're still hung up on their, their misguided, misunderstood way of what, what Jesus was going to do. They're thinking he's bringing a kingdom to Israel, physical Israel. He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Boy, isn't that a word that so many in our religious world still need to hear? It's not for you to know when God's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, it goes on in verse 8. I won't get up on that soapbox any further. But, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I think this is uh, one reason this is such an important story and uh, should be talked about more is that it's really Jesus' greatest glorification while on earth. You know, in the eyes of his disciples at least, uh, from that reading at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, we, we learn that we learn where this occurs. Um, it says that it occurs out near Bethany. Remember Bethany? That was the place where during the last week, uh, Jesus nearly each night with his disciples left the city of Jerusalem after whatever it was they did during the day, left the city, walked out across the valley, up the Mount of Olives, across that mountain to this little village of Bethany where they stayed. And Luke tells us that, that this is where, um, or at least near Bethany, is where Jesus ascends. So if you think about that, Jesus ascends over Jerusalem. You know, uh, anybody that was looking, I guess, could have seen this man being lifted up into the heavens uh, but basically from the Mount of Olives, Jesus ascends. And that, that's appropriate in so many ways because it's about six weeks prior to this that it had all started at the Mount of Olives. Remember Jesus uh, riding the donkey over the crest of the hill, looking out, weeping over Jerusalem, then riding down into the city? 
um, down from the slopes of the Mount of Olives and the gates of the city. It all began uh, about six weeks before he actually ascends from that same spot. And, um, and Jesus, after he ascends, if we think about that for just a moment, he, uh, his role changes. You know, his role in the Godhead, I guess we might say. Uh, as we read study the rest of the New Testament, Jesus, of course, is no longer a physical presence on earth with his disciples after this. Uh, his role now is at the right hand of God. He is a heavenly intercessor, uh, an advocate in heaven for us on behalf of believers. Um, we know from Scripture that there is an accuser of the brethren, Satan, uh, but there is an a even greater advocate with the Father, that is Jesus. And instead of being the active agent of the Godhead on earth with the disciples, uh, Jesus' role is now in heaven. Uh, the active agent of the Godhead on earth now becomes the Holy Spirit, who Jesus had promised. And, and so uh, that change is made in God's work among his people. It's interesting, again, here in, in the Acts 1 account, the disciples have these questions for Jesus. You know, when, when, when is the Father going to establish the kingdom, that kind of thing? Uh, Jesus does not answer their question. He gives them instead a mission. Uh, that, that's often the case, isn't it? Um, we, we might have questions. God has a mission for us, and he wants us to focus on that. You know, I, sometimes I think of strange things, strange questions, uh, like, why do it this way? Why ascend? You know, Jesus could have just vanished. Um, he suddenly appeared to his disciples on several occasions. Uh, he could apparently just you know, appear or disappear. And that's not the way this is done. He, he is lifted up, Luke specifically tells us, in, into the heavens. And you, you wonder why. Um, there might be several reasons. That's sort of a permanent picture, isn't it? Um, giving them the message, there's not going to be any more appearances. This is, he's going away for now. We're not going to see him like this again. And so maybe it gave them a sense of permanent change that they needed. And uh, to point out that they, they're not, you know, they're, they're now to start looking for someone else to come. He tells them, go to Jerusalem and you will receive uh, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. And so an emphasis now in their work on earth with the Holy Spirit. And again, a focus sort of on the commission, the mission that they've been given. The, the purpose of this wasn't to amaze them, to get them to stare up into the heavens. Uh, they're almost rebuked for doing so by the, the angels that appear. But to but to get them to focus on what they've been charged and commanded to do. So the ascension, really important, and I wish we would uh, study and, and teach about it and preach about it more because it's there for a reason, and there are great lessons for us. Well, I've enjoyed doing uh, these, these lessons with you, and I hope they've been a benefit to you and uh, that, that this particular study this evening has been a help to you. Um, if you have suggestions for future broadcasts, um, please let me know. Uh, I'm happy to do some more of these. Hopefully we're getting closer and closer to the time where we can be face to face and uh, we'll continue to pray for that. But hope you're well and that God is um, growing you through this trial that we're facing. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your word and all the riches that are there for us. And pray most of all that we will learn how to live 
for you in our world and how to share the good news of Jesus, that he is your son and that he is indeed king, that he is Christ, uh, and that we will live in that truth. Thank you for your love through him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.